Radio Conference. All right, this is going to be the best session yet. Please give a big hand to all of your speakers preemptively, but most importantly to our first speaker, which I believe is Caleb. I feel like the guy with the cooler hat should get the more applause. Um, oh, is it starting? Go? Okay. So, um, I'm Caleb Collins Parks. Uh, I'm the maker of AREPLE, a real time Python evaluator. I'd like to start out by saying hi to the four people who are actually from Cleveland and the 9,900 people who are from SF. Um, <laughs> Uh, the reason why I wanted to make a real-time interactive evaluator is I was reading Brett Victor's talk, Brett Victor is great by the way, on uh, the future of programming, and I realized that programming as we know it is fundamentally flawed. The, because beginner and expert alike, we may think we know what we're doing, but do we actually know what we're doing? For sure, 100%. How many times have you thought, oh yeah, this code's going to work, and you run it, and then the computer explodes? Yeah, it happens. Um, so there's systems in place to help avoid this kind of errors, like type checking. Python, despite not having explicit types, is strongly typed. So we'll catch type errors if you have a good IDE like um, PyCharm or Visual Studio Code. But the only way to know for sure that your program works is to run it. So what if there was a system that literally ran your program as you were editing the code? And that is a REPL. So I'm going to do a tech demo here. And I'm just going to do the simplest possible code, because tech demos are easy to mess up. So 1 plus 1 is 2. Hopefully, you guys already know that. <laughs> and then I can edit this. And I'm never pressing the run key here. I just type. It's that simple. And let's do something more complex. That. Yeah. We get our uh, variable display here, sort of like debugging, editing, same time. Fiddle around with that. So this should be uh, great for, like, the educational tool. Um, beginners like trying to mess around with Python uh, should be easier than using the terminal where you just have one line at a time. And also just as a scratch pad to test out small Python snippets. Um, but the best part about this is it will catch your errors. So if I try to print numlist um, 99, then yeah, list index out of range. Um, because I see the error the instant I type this, I have a connotation between the error and the code I just typed. So I know that what I just typed is wrong, and I can look at the num list, and yeah, it's only 11 items. So yeah, accessing element 9,000 isn't going to work. Let's fix this. And we got a print output here. Works. So if you want to use a REPL, you can just Google it. It's free and open source. Um, and then I'm also going to give a shout out to two other great extensions. There's Wolf, which is similar to AREPL, but it displays values in line, so it looks slightly cooler. And Birdseye, which is like AREPL, not real time, but displays, uh, has a great variable display, and it will actually work in your uh, production app. You just give a decorator on your function, and it will, you can have a debug it later on. Um, AirApple is available at, for VS Code and as a standalone Electron app. Thanks for listening. All right. Thank you very much, Caleb. That was excellent. Everyone that's coming in, hey, quick, 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 come in. Come and sit near the front. There's lots of room at the front. Squeeze past down the rows. Get closer to the speaker. This is the lightning talks. You already missed one amazing one. But guess what? There's at least another 12 amazing ones to come. One of which is going to be my friend Michael Ford's talk. Please give Michael a huge hat. Thank you, everyone. Um, this is a very abstract talk. That not, there's not really time to give examples, but I hope that the, the application to the day-to-day -day challenge of the practice of software engineering is going to be clear, because the only theory worth a damn is the theory of, a pra of the practice. 
This is a talk about the role of abstractions in software engineering. And the image, by the way, is an abstract representation of a concrete apple. Programming is all about the use of abstractions. We often like to say that the language that computers speak is binary, ones and zeros. That's not actually true. Um, ones and zeros are an abstract representation of the fundamental operation of computers. It's a way of representing what central processes do in a way that can be understood by humans. The actual language spoken by computers is the electromagnetic dance across wires and etched silicon choreographed by the beating of a quartz crystal at the heart of the machine. Ones and zeros are a representation of that dance, understandable by humans, that allows us to reason about the behavior of the system. Now, that's a very low-level abstraction. It's very close to the actual operation of the computers, but it's very hard to work with ones and zeros. And I expect uh, quite a few of you have some experience of that, messing around with hardware. But the next step up, the next level of abstraction, is assembly language. And there we get to use mnemonics, um, symbolic instructions like JMP for jump, to represent these patterns of ones and zeros. And there we also get to use human recognizable labels for memory locations instead of having to use numbers. And that allows the assembler to calculate offsets for us. Way easier, different level of abstraction. And then stepping up the, the levels, we have languages like C. And right at the very top, we get Python, where each construct in the language, like a print statement, for example, might actually correspond to millions, perhaps, of, uh, of the very lowest level operations. Computer programming is communication in two directions. Programming provides a language that the computer understands and is able to execute deterministically, whilst also communicating with humans so that they can conceptualize the behavior of the system. So a programming language is a set of conceptual tools that facilitates the communication in both of those directions, to the, the hardware so that it can execute the instructions and to humans who are reading the code. So the art and the craft of software engineering is taking the conceptual tools that programming languages provide and using them to solve real world problems. And that's the difference between science and engineering. The theory is science and the application is engineering. So in order to be able to do this, in order to solve problems, we have to have an understanding of the problem domain. We conceptualize the problem domain, we think about it. So software is easy to maintain and understand when the abstractions you build map well to the problem domain. If the way you think about the problem corresponds easily to the way you think about your software, then there's less translation to do between the two, less mental overhead. Joel Spolsky talks about the law of leaky abstractions. Any abstraction that maps to lower level operations leaks. At some point, something's gonna go wrong and in order to even understand the problem, you have to understand the level below. Now, I've heard it said, and it rings true, that a good programmer can hold about 10,000 lines of code in their head. So if your system is less than 10,000 lines of code, even if it's really, really bad code, you don't really need to build these higher level building blocks to hold it all in your head. And an all too common situation, I'm afraid, is when a system grows beyond the level where you can hold it all in your head, an engineer decides, right, I'm gonna create some abstractions to, to simplify how I think about this system. So we tend to create these black boxes into which we put the complexity. And these type of abstractions conceal complexity. The great advantage of them is that now you don't have to look at the mess you just made. You can reason about your system using your black boxes, but in order to understand what's actually ha happening, you have to go digging in the dirt. So instead of concealing a complexity, a good abstraction explains and points you to the lower level operations. Good abstractions simplify and reveal complexity rather than concealing complexity. Now we can also use the same kind of thinking to think about product and system design. What user experience do you provide? What's your user story? Your users also 
think about the problem domain using conceptual tools. As soon as you start thinking about something, that's an abstraction, that's a conceptual tool. So the closer that the abstractions that your software provides to represent the problem domain, um, the closer those abstractions map to the way your user already thinks about the problem, the easier the software is going to be to use. And that's where we come full circle. If the way you build your software maps well to the problem domain, then it's going to be easy for you to reason about and to maintain. And if the abstractions you present to the user map well to the problem domain, then it will be easier for them to think within the system and be intuitive to use. Amazing. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much, Michael. Up next is Alvaro. Please give him a big hand to talk about coffee, which is a personal passion of mine. Hi. So my name is Alvaro. I'm also known as Turicas. There are some links in this presentation. You can like uh, see my Twitter account to, to check out uh, where these slides are. Um, so my Twitter, GitHub, everything is Turicas. Uh, I'm going to talk about automation and uh, uh, I personally love coffee and I'm going to talk about roasting coffee with Python. I mean, automating the whole thing. Uh, automation is very good because it reduces costs for your time on boring tasks and is less error prone. So we programmers usually love it. So for me, for example, it's very fun to automate boring tasks. And uh, some weeks ago, uh, I, I worked uh, collecting, ex extracting, and converting public data. And for example, I've automated the process of extracting a table from a PDF file. And uh, if, if you want to check out, there is this Rose library and command line interface I've written to, to do this kind of boring stuff. So I love to automate things. And in my daily job, I really, really love to uh, create uh, automated processes. But let's talk about coffee. Uh, if you are not from Brazil, uh, you probably don't, <laughs> don't know this guy. This guy appeared uh, on live TV yelling, I want a coffee, and things like this. So Quero Café is like, I want a coffee. And uh, we, we really, really love coffee. Brazil is actually uh, the top one producer of coffee in the world, and we have a, a bunch of good coffee in there. So starting uh, from the whole process, just so you know uh, what happens in the process. So there are these coffee trees, and there's the fruit, right? And then there's a uh, process uh, a bit automated, at least in, in Brazil, uh, to extract the beans from the fruit, right? Then you use a machine to roast the coffee. This one is a 12 kilogram machine uh, to, to roast, and there are a lot of roast profiles. And then you extract it, and then you can drink that good coffee, right? So uh, one thing that is, is, is really not common in Brazil is to have automated machines. So uh, I was wondering and asking uh, some friends that have a coffee shop in, in Brazil, why we can't automate this? I mean, why it's not already automated? And then we started uh, searching for some software. There's one uh, written in Python called Artisan. Uh, that you can automate a part of the process, but we didn't have uh, good machines, uh, roasting machines on, in Brazil uh, to, to plug into the software. So we needed to write our own software to do it. Um, so how uh, we are using Python uh, to automate the whole process. First, we are collecting data, like from temperature sensors uh, into the machine. Uh, we are logging everything. So we have like millisecond uh, logs of all the data from the machine we can analyze later. Uh, we can also trace like uh, your favorite flavor uh, in coffee and then create a specific roast profile for this kind of flavor. Uh, we control the gas flow so we can fire up or down the, the, the roaster. We can open and close the doors like for the bean to enter in the roaster and then to exit and things like this. And uh, of course we can reproduce any roast profile you want to. So since you, we are logging everything, we can reproduce it it later. Uh, there's a quick video here I want to show you. Uh, it was just one of the first tests, so things are improving now. But there is this command line interface. There's no sound here, 
sorry, I'm going to mute it. Uh, so there's a command line interface. Uh, oops, let's play it. And uh, this is the machine. It's a 12 kilogram machine. I don't know how many pounds is it, but we should use kilograms, right? Um, so <laughs> <laughs> this command line interface is showing like for uh, some log information, and uh, it waits for the best temperature for to, to drop the coffee beans in to the roaster, and then it controls everything, the gas flow, etc. Uh, this is a simple interface the machine has. Uh, you can control some things here, but the software like can control everything. I mean, every sensor, every kind of actuator and motor inside the the, the machine. So my time is running up. Uh, here is the log. This video is on YouTube. You can search for it. Uh, so this is, I think this is the time when it's finishing. Let me see here. Um, yeah, so there is this cooler and the, the, the whole uh, process basically is like uh, when it finishes, uh, we need to cool down uh, the beans and then we can package it and, I mean, put the beans into another machine to automate it. Uh, uh, to automate the, the process of packaging. So everything is made in Python. Um, I'm using a library here to uh, talk to the machine using a protocol called Modbus. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Alvaro. Thank you for keeping to time. That was almost perfect. Uh, up next is Petra. Please give him a big hand talking about async. Um, hello. Uh, so there's this thing called async, and I hear a lot of people tell me they don't understand async at all. Uh, I found one way of explaining it that helps some people. So uh, if you want async explained in five minutes, this talk is for you. For the other ones, you know, it's just five minutes. Uh, so uh, meet Blinky. Uh, Blinky is this uh, ASCII art thing that blinks. Uh, Blinky has some source code. Uh, I hope you can read it. I unfortunately cannot make it bigger. Uh, so Blinky is a class. It has some in it. It has a face. Uh, when you convert it to string, it just shows the face. It has a method so you can set the face, which automatically prints what you can see. Uh, and then it has a run function, which is just a loop, uh, where it sets one face, uh, waits a bit, sets another face, waits another bit, and goes on and on and on. There's a print blinky function, and uh, you, can, you can run it, right? So uh, I hope most of you will understand this code. Uh, now, Blinky has one big problem. Blinky is uh, lonely. So let's uh, give Blinky some friends. How do I do that? I import threading. Uh, these little green marks show what's, uh, what's changed, right? So I import threading. Uh, I give a little bit different timeout just, a, just so it looks better. There's a print Blinky's function that puts them all in a row. And uh, I make some blinkings, and then I start threads. So what does this do? I have you know 16 cores on my computer, so each core runs one animation only. It's all in parallel, uh, all great, uh, until I upgrade my print blinkies function to the enterprise-ready print, print blinkies 2.0, which uh, does a little bit more. Uh, work, and suddenly it all goes bad. Why? Because all of these Blinkies share state, and they all try to uh, call this print Blinkies function all at the same time, and they overlap each other, so that while one is in the middle of printing, the other one is also in the middle of printing, and so they overwrite each other's progress. Uh, now, how do, I, how do I change this? How do I make it better? There's uh, this thing that uh, Twisted and uh, Node.js uh, came up with, well, came up with, uh, are famous for, which is I have functions that are 
executed all at once, so nothing interrupts this function. So what is different here? I have close eyes and open eyes, and close eyes says, in some time, please call the function open eyes, right? So after this many seconds, this function get, gets called, then after this many seconds, after this is done, uh, this function gets called again, right? So this works. It's, it's pretty nice. Uh, there is some setup uh, needed to run all this. It uses the async IO library. Uh, read the documentation for that. This, it's just some boilerplate. So this is nice. Uh, what's, is not, what's nice in here is that if I uh, sleep a little bit here, it will still work. It won't overwrite anything. It will just be a little bit slower. Uh, the problem, uh, yeah, so, the main thing is here is this all happens at one point. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing uh, is really happening at the same time. One function runs, then another function runs, then another function runs, and there's uh, an event loop that ties it all together. Uh, the problem here is uh, these functions are really implementing a loop. Right? It doesn't look like that. It's some kind of weird trampoline, one function calling the other. Uh, if I wanted to do some more complex logic than, uh, than just a loop, it would all just fall apart. So what we do instead is use async and await. And this looks like a loop. Uh, and whenever I use this await thing, I say, now I'm giving time for uh, other things to run. So whenever I use a wait, other things get a chance to run. Uh, there's still some boilerplate to set it up. Uh, otherwise, this looks like a normal loop. Uh, I'm getting out of, I'm running out of time, right? So uh, if you would like to learn more about async stuff, I recommend going to the Trio library, which is very similar uh, to async.io. They have a very nice tutorial that teaches you all you need to know. Uh, of course, there's some uh, input-output, the I.O. thing that usually goes with this, but... Uh, Thank you, Peter. All right, up next is, remind me, oh, no, I need to check my list, here we go. It is Matt. Matt's amazing. Please give him a huge hand. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, one of the four Clevelanders who's here. Uh, and I'd like to apologize on behalf of Cleveland for the weather. It's been gorgeous all week, and it's horrifying now. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, type hinting and asserting type hints, which our lovely host, when he saw my talk, he said, type hints are a bad idea, and thinking about asserting them is worse. So we know his opinion. <laughs> Uh, so I, uh, like I think a bunch of you, went to uh, Hillel Wayne's talk, uh, Beyond Unit Tests, and while I was sitting in there, he had a really cool thing where he was putting all these uh, at decorators in front of functions and adding all kinds of cool things on unit tests. And the one thing that stuck out to me was that, you know, he wasn't using type hinting to uh, enforce the types. So if you're like me, you might write some silly function like this, uh, some function. Oh, I'm sorry. How about that? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we did it. All right. Uh, so, so you might make some function like this, and it's going to return a float. Uh, and we'll just return float of A. OK, easy, simple function. Uh, as we all know, Python does absolutely nothing to enforce this so I can give it, you know, a string and it gives me some horrifying error. So uh, that's where I thought, okay, what would be cool is if there was a nice little function uh, that could just read my type hints for me and add the asserts. Because what I might do in my job before would be I'd do something like this. I'd add an assert in here. Assert is instance a int error message. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's really busy, especially when you have a whole bunch of things. So I didn't want to do that, and I'm not checking the outputs. So I wrote a little thing, pretty quick, from, from assert types. 
And now you can add a little decorator in front of this. And now if you run this, it'll still give you an error, but it'll give an error that says, oh, argument A is supposed to be a string, and then it's supposed to be a class. So I felt really good about this. I uh, hacked this together in the hallway, uh, and then I proceeded to do what you do in 2018, which is you take the guy who kind of inspired you to do it, and you add him on Twitter, and you send him it. And then he did what you do in 2018, which is he sends you to the GitHub that already does this. <laughs> So, you can pip install assert types. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but what's even cooler is you can from enforce import uh, runtime validation, and it literally does the same thing. So, he gives you a runtime error instead of an assert error, and he gives you a handy message at the bottom. They're very, very similar. Uh, but it's cool if you like type hinting. So that's what I got. Amazing. Thank you, Matt. Have I got Terrence uh, in the building somewhere? Terrence? Was that a yes? Terrence? I'm going to say that's a no. All right. Thank you very much. So instead of Terrence, we're going to have Nick. Are you ready to replace him? Yeah. OK. Um, you're not, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, and in the meantime, we'll have the amazing Scott. Thank you very much. Give him a hand. Hey, everybody. Um, so there's a saying, um, in, especially in Lisp and other pro programming languages, that a closure is a poor man's object, and an object is a poor man's closure. Um, and that's sort of suggesting that there's these two fundamental programming constructs that are sort of morally equivalent, right? Um, so today, uh, I may have misheard that quote slightly, so I'm going to show you a slightly different uh, one. So this talk is uh, a class is a poor man's loop. Um, so the origin of this talk, uh, this talk starts with uh, me and my roommate, Joe Jevnik, sitting on the couch at like 2 a.m. in our apartment um, doing what we always do, which is talk about Python metaprogramming. Um, and one of the things that we realized during this particular conversation was that the following is valid Python syntax. Um, so I can do plus plus i. And what this actually does is uh, sort of a little known, not very useful operator is that plus is a prefix operator in Python. And this is uh, double underscore pause or dunder pause. Um, this is the unary positive operator. So if you wanted to have some type that had some notion of like it, the positive version of itself, you might implement this. Um, and in particular, it does not do what you might think that it does if you come from like a C or C++ or a Java programming background, which is to increment i. So uh, what you see this used for most often is in languages like C, you might write a for loop that looks something like this. You do for int i equals 0, and you do a semicolon, i less than, say, 10, um, and then plus plus i. And say so we'll just do printf percent d or i equals percent d backslash n i uh, semicolon. There you go, right? So this is sort of your standard, uh, like, you know, print, print some integers in, in C. And I can take that and compile it and run it and write it. It prints, you know, i equals 0, i equals 1, equals, i equals 2, et cetera. Um, and one thing that we all know about C is that it's renowned for sort of its expressive abilities and its ability to concisely express exactly what we as programmers want to do. And so as Python programmers, we're jealous of C, and we really want to be able to <laughs> write our code and write our looping constructs in a way that sort of gets us that full expressive power of C. Um, and for a while, we were, my, my colleague and I were talking about this, and we didn't think it was possible until we realized that this plus plus i syntax was valid. Um, and so uh, a couple of hours later, we sort of raced to, to figure out a solution for this, um, and the result was this library. So I'm going to do from loop import loop. Uh, and then I'm going to say class for loop. Uh, i equals 0, semicolon, i less than 10, semicolon, plus plus i, <laughs> print i. So that's great. So we've gotten sort of the basic, you know, expressive power of C for loops, but of course there's many other features of C loops that we'd like to be able to emulate. So for example, in C I can do something like if, you know, if uh, i mod 
zero. Right, so if I've got an odd number, then I'll say print uh, continue. Thank you. Uh, and this really should be a puts, but oh well. Uh, and then I'll say continue, right? So this says, if this condition is true, I want to skip this iteration and just go back to the top of the loop. Um, so it would be nice if we could do that in, in Cloop, and it turns out we can. So I can say, uh, if I mod two continue, uh, you'll notice I did not import that. And now we've skipped those values. Um, and, and of course, the, the third sort of important loop construct that we might want to be able to implement is breaking. So I can do, you know, if I, you know, equal equals six, say, then I don't want to do this loop anymore. I just want to break out and, and stop the loop. So let's do break. Um, and we can again implement that with cloop. So I'll say if I equal equals six, break. I'll say print done. And we can break out of our loops. So we, we've now sort of recovered the full expressive power of C style for loops. Um, if you're deeply concerned about how this is implemented or, or you're just, or you want to sort of uh, convince me to choose another uh, profession, uh, you, can, you can find the source code for this at our, our GitHub repository, which is fiendish devilry slash cloop, um, which is C style for loops as Python classes because that's totally a thing you wanted. Amazing. I hope Mark Smith is somewhere in the audience watching that. Uh, up next is Nick, who's going to tell us about alternatives to HTTP, so you must clap for him, please. So uh, often we learn HTTP because that's what the browser uses to talk to servers, and it's really great for browsers, but we also use it for service-to-service -service communication when we would try to do uh, service-oriented architecture, and I think that's a bad idea. But uh, so why is HTTP so bad, you might ask? Well, one reason is because it's just a bad protocol. I mean, it's text-based, which is easy to understand, but it's also slow in today's modern world. Well, we have fixed this, right? We created HTTP2, and that's supposed to solve these things. But the problem is HTTP2 requires a cert. Yeah, someone out there is going to say, no, it doesn't. But yeah, it does, because no one's implemented it correctly. So anyways, your service doesn't have a cert, so pretty much HTTP2 is out the window. So your next question is, OK, what do we do? Well, in service-oriented architecture, this is typically called a transport or a message bus, right? And there's two kinds. There's distributed and there's centralized. So distributed is basically HTTP and other things, and centralized is some other like queuing type technologies. So in distributed, basically every single service that you have has to talk to every other service. This creates a lot of network overhead, and you have a lot of network thrashing going on in a large production environment. Whereas in a centralized environment, you basically have every service talking to a single hub. So they only have to make connections to that one hub. It causes a lot less network overhead. So some of the differences mean that in a distributed world, you have to have a load balancer to try to distribute the load between everything. The problem is these load balancers like Nginx, they don't do a very good job because they don't actually know the real load that your service is handling. It only estimates or round robins, et cetera. It actually really is a balancing act. Whereas in centralized, what happens is the service goes to the message bus and tells it, hey, I'm ready for more. So you can actually guarantee that your service will not handle connections if it is not ready to handle the load. Next, you have a thing called connection bleeding or connection draining. Basically, if you're in a distributed world, you have to handle bleeding or draining your connections before you can shut it down. That way, you don't get connection timeouts, because that will bring you down. Whereas in a centralized world, because your service is actually asking for the request itself, it can simply just shut off. So one of the biggest cons to a centralized world is you have latency, because you have an extra hop. You also have a single point of failure. Uh, this is definitely the biggest con to centralized. However, it's really interesting that most people implement HTTP by sticking a load balancer in between every single service, in which case you're basically using a distributed architecture like a centralized one. So one huge pro to a centralized architecture is it can actually route anywhere. The biggest con to HTTP and similar alternatives is you have to have an actual open port 
on that machine in order to get traffic, right? That means you have to either be in the VPC or have an IP address that can actually route, et cetera. So let's say, for example, you wanted to do something really awesome, really stupid, and you wanted to uh, intercept your production traffic and send it to your actual local machine, right? That's a great idea. Well, with HTTP, you could do it, but it would actually be really hard. You'd have to do a lot of things, and pretty much the security people on your team would tell you no. Whereas with centralized, all you'd have to do is get your computer, your computer to connect to the centralized message bus, and then you could simply just ask for a request, and you would get it. So I am totally skipping over an entirely third concept called event sourcing, which basically means you don't have any inter-process communication at all. Everything kind of figures out each other based on events. Um, I'm going to totally skip over that, but if you're interested, go look it up. So now you're all asking, okay, so if HTTP is so bad, why do we all use it? Well, I think honestly it just boils down to HTTP really is the de facto, right? It's been built up from ever since the web was born, and it's just built into all of our frameworks, right? Every single framework is built entirely on HTTP, and the biggest problem is if you want to go away from HTTP, you really can't without throwing the entire framework out the window. So. I'm currently building an open source project. It's just an idea of how to build a transport agnostic framework that doesn't really care what transport you're using. It'll just work the same either way. So if you're interested, come talk to me, come check it out, whatever. Thanks. Nick. Far from whatever, that was absolutely excellent. Um, please now give a big hand to Alan, who will be talking about modeling and simulation in Python. Hello, PyCon. It's nice to see you. I was here last year, and I told you about this book project. And I asked for help, and I got help. I got a bunch of great conversations. So I went and wrote the book. And it's called Modeling and Simulation in Python. And now I'm back to ask for your help again, because I want more help. So let me tell you about the project and why you might care about it. American. Ed uh, engineering education is really broken. About half of the people who start doing an engineering degree don't graduate in engineering. They either change majors or they don't graduate at all. And a big part of the reason is the science and math death march, which is a lot of programs start out with one or two years of math and science before you get to do anything that looks like engineering. And this drives a lot of people out, and it drives out a lot of people who might go on and be really great engineers. So one piece of this is the freshman physics class, which I am working on trying to fix. And here's what I think it should be. Here's what modeling and simulation is about. If you want to understand the physical world, you identify the thing you're interested in. You make modeling decisions about what you can leave out and what the essential features are that you have to capture. And then you do mathematical analysis and you run simulations. You use them to predict something, to explain why the world behaves the way it does. You do it to design something. You have to validate and you have to iterate. These are all important parts of the modeling process that engineers have to learn about. But what they learn about in most engineering programs is just the mathematical analysis part until they drop. So we're working on this class. This is at Olin College, where I teach, a class called Modeling and Simulation, where we're trying to teach all of that modeling process, because we think it's really important. We've been doing this since 2009, but for about the first 10 years, we were teaching this class in MATLAB. We're sorry. <laughs> but in fall 2017, we switched it over to Python, and we've been using a bunch of, thank you. And we've been using a bunch of Jupyter Notebooks, which has worked really well for that class. You can see the example there is the axe throwing example, which is one of my favorites. The basis of the class, most of what we're doing is using ODE solvers and root finders and optimization to do prediction, explanation, and design. The examples that we look at are not just the usual mechanics that you see in a freshman physics class, but also discrete models like population and queuing theory first-order systems like epidemiology and thermal systems, and also second-order systems like mechanics. 
So the kind of help I'm looking for, I hope that you will look at the draft of what we've done and the code and the notebooks. I'd love ideas for more examples and student projects that they can work on, recommendations for libraries to use and other techniques. We'd love to talk to you more about this. And I know what you're thinking. Where can you find this book? If only the URL were somewhere where you could find it. It is at modsimpy.com, and you can grab the book in PDF. And there's a GitHub repository there if you want to send me a pull request. And that's a great way to contribute if you get a chance. And I appreciate it. There are a bunch of ways to get in touch with me. Thank you. Fantastic timing. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Petra, are you ready to go? I am. Are you guys ready to give him a big hand? Then that is what you do. All right, everybody. So I am going to talk about Python and architecture and design. And in true designer style, I've made the font very, very small and very, very thin. Um, all right, so who am I? Uh, my name is Peter. And I work as a building information modeling specialist for Kieran Timberlake. Uh, Kieran Timberlake is an architecture firm, but I do work within the research group um, and a specific subset of it called uh, the Design Computation Core. Uh, my information here, I've also uh, listed it. Feel free to um, you know, yell at me on Twitter later if, if you're not happy with stuff, or, or look there for the slides if you'd like. Um, so first, just a little bit of background on architecture and design. So this is an industry which has historically always lagged behind technological advancements of other professions. Um, and our really, uh, typically our introduction to computation or to Python or to code in general is via visual programming. Um, so this is kind of what that looks like, if anybody's ever seen it before. I like to call this uh, spaghetti and meatballs. Um, so essentially what it is is you have blocks uh, and you have wires, blocks uh, or operators or variables, uh, data moves from left to right, and you can uh, really use that to design without um, knowing how to code. So then once people kind of master this and they get really, really comfortable with it, we bust out the cool stuff. Uh, which is, I don't know if you can hopefully see that Python logo, but that's, that's a Python node uh, that actually finds itself uh, in one of these environments. And right, the simple stuff, uh, you start with a hello world, um, and then very quickly uh, you see that there's a lot of power behind the thing. Um, that's a shot of the IDE on the left, and on the right is what the little node looks like. You can add more variables, you can add more outputs, um, and it really just uh, opens you up to, to a world which you couldn't access before. Um, so our, our main visual uh, scripting environments are, are Grasshopper, which finds itself in Rhino, which is a, a program for design and 3D modeling. And the other one is, is Dynamo. It's found in uh, Autodesk's uh, Revit, which is a, a program for building information modeling and documentation. Um, so just a couple of examples to show you guys what some of this analysis looks like. So it can be anything as simple as this, where we take a staircase and we say, you know what, uh, where is the staircase too low? Where would somebody you know, hit their heads walking up and down the staircase? Um, and we can ramp up the complexity. Uh, we can uh, work with computational geometry. We can do form analysis, form generation, form optimization, um, all kinds of things uh, like that. And we can keep ramping up uh, the kind of uh, complicated nature of things. Uh, so what this is doing is actually using Python to uh, check bounding box intersections and find unique conditions in uh, a huge tower, which has hundreds uh, of unique panels and thousands of panels total. Um, and uh, with the Power Python again, so not only can we do those intersections, we can uh, compare strings, we can do all kinds of stuff, uh, especially with you know the multitudes of libraries that are available to us. Um, so one more jump in complexity, uh, again in the same environments, but we also do a lot of analysis in these environments, and and analysis is a super broad word. Uh, I think that the examples here I'm showing are. Uh, some solar analysis, thermal analysis, um, and I think an instance of, of structural analysis. But what this is, uh, why, the reason why this is great for us is because it gives us a visual output. So when we come to the client later, we don't just show them a CSV uh, full of numbers. We we show them, you know, actual takeaways. Um, and then we don't always just stay in the visual programming environment. Of course, we uh, also step into the real code. Um, so this is an example of a case study like that. So analysis we already talked about, but what if you want to simulate, right? That's, that's quite different, and I'm sure you've heard a ton of talks about it already. Um, so this is an instance where we actually intersect the two. So we use the visual programming interface to uh, democratize that access, to work with the, the things that make sense to work with visually, and then we uh, uh, prepare our actual ML models in the environment that makes sense, scikit-learn, so you know, your preferred IDE, so on and so forth. 
Um, and the last kind of jump in complexity is this one right here. So we're also kind of now wading into the question of generative design. So this is a case study where uh, we have these as criteria, and then we are essentially using these um, using these criteria to generate a number of, of designs that optimize any given criteria uh, and, and uh, eventually kind of score them based on those criteria and then let the user select what um, they want to show. So I'm getting really close to time, and uh, so I want to just lastly just thank everybody uh, for listening, for organizing and contributing, uh, sharing your knowledge, uh, democratizing computational agency in, in all the many forms that it entails. And very last but not least, please check out our work. I hope you like it. Thank you. Amazing. All right, our next speaker is talking about Bayesian hacking with a language called Python. If you've heard of that one, please give him a big hand. Good evening, PyCon. My name is Stephen Howell. I'm a data scientist at Booz Allen Hamilton. I work out of Lexington Park, Maryland on a uh, Navy contract for the F-18 Super Hornet. If that's interesting, we're looking for data scientists and data engineers. Um, I'm here tonight to show you a little toy problem that um, really sparked my curiosity. Uh, so I'm going to give you, each of you, a bag of coins. There's 100 coins in that. 99 of those coins are fair coins. And one of those coins has heads on both sides. You take a coin randomly out of that bag and flip it 10 times, and you get heads every time. Now, how likely is it you got the unfair coin? Probably pretty likely, I'd say, like, yeah, definitely, right? But I don't know. So um, how do we solve this? Well, there's this thing called conditional probability, and we don't like math because we're Python coders, and so you can solve it that way, but, but let's simulate it instead. So um, here's the analytic solution. Feel free to go back and look at this. This is up on GitHub. But let's um, do this as a simulation. So we like NumPy. We do it for all our numerical stuff. And bokeh plotting. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. Yep, uh, too much. All right, is that good? All right, we're going to use bokeh for the plotting. Um, I'll show you a little bit now. So here we go. We're going to first start by building our system. We need 100 coins. There we go. Uh, we're going to define all those coins to be 0. Now let's randomly pick one of those 100 coins and flip it to be 1 instead. That's the unfair coin. Now we need to define the draw flip routine. So. Um, I told you we're going to do 10. I made it so we could change that later if we wanted to. And, and if you used a different coin set, you could, you could change that as well. But um, first, we get the coin index. We're going to randomly pick one of the coins out of that bag. And that's right here. Then did I execute this. Yeah, cool. OK, make sure I don't get behind. All right, randomly pick one of those coins. and. Uh, and pull it out. That's the drawn coin here. Now, did we get the unfair coin or not? Well, let's check it. If it's equal to one, it's unfair. We know we're going to flip heads every time. We don't have to do anything else. Skip. If it's not the unfair coin, well, now you got to flip, 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 flip. And down here, each flip, we're going to give it a probability. If it's greater than half, it got heads. If it's less than half, it got tails. And if this stays true the whole time, it'll go to the end, and we will yield the um, unfair coin. We'll report back and say, yes, I got, or will we yield if that coin was unfair or fair? So this is only going to return something when you get heads 10 times. Uh, I execute that. All right. So here we go. Let's give it a run. Reach in the bag, pull it out, flip. Reach in the bag, pull it out, flip. And I'm doing this 5 million times. Now, this is where I say computers are awesome. That's why we code, right? <laughs> uh, if you wanted to pay somebody to do this 5 million times, I feel bad. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's going to take a little bit, but I didn't optimize this, or I just kind of threw this together. So. Um, uh, and yeah, there we go. And 
we got 91% were unfair. And that's a really close match to the analytic solution. Let's plot that. So here is a bouquet plot. And we see there on the x-axis the um, index for which time you flipped heads 10 times. And the y-axis is um, looking back at all the previous runs, averaging and say, well, out of all those previous runs, this many times was the fair coin, this many times was the unfair coin. And the orange line there is the analytic result, and the blue is the simulated. You see they match pretty well. So let's put it into an app. <laughs> and every time I flip pages. So here on the right is a bokeh app I put together. It looks like I'm running out of time. Essentially the same thing. Uh, let's... Uh, yeah, there we go. Serve this up. So um, let's go ahead, reach in. I set it to be pretty slow at first, so you reach, flip, flip, flip. You're not going to get much. But there, right at the beginning, okay, you got the unfair coin. Let's speed this up. So we're simulating. Look, I'm a, I'm a, yeah, right? So let this run and yeah, pretty cool. So you can do great stuff. Thank you. Thanks very much. When you see the pretty graph and something moving, that was the high point of the, uh, the whole talk. So it's good to end on a high note. <laughs> uh, the next uh, talk coming up uh, is uh, James, who's going to be talking about, wait a minute. That's not what I remember. Mm, what are you sports. talking about? Tell us, wait, well, just give him a big hand and then maybe he'll tell us what he's about to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'll start the timer now. Okay, it, well, you, you'll see what it's about. It's actually like two parts and I just put this together in like uh, the last hour, so don't complain about typos or like dangling modifiers or anything like that. Uh, my name's James Saxon and thanks for having me. Um, uh, what I'm gonna talk about first, started out with a hike. I have a friend, he PhD in computer science, and he's like, uh, you know, this, this money in politics, it's really bothering me. This is what we do on hikes, I guess. Um, and uh, it, it sort of stuck in my head, because I guess I was exhausted, I couldn't think straight. So um, I noticed that there was this thing called the California Clean Money Campaign. And it had this really bad website, but they were having meetings. So I went to it, and there were like 900 people on the mailing list, a needy website, and it was in 2002. Okay, so I was there, and um, I, I think, oh, they're going to try to pass this thing where they have public funding of elections in two years. That'll be great. I can help with the website. So I got my friend, the hiker, and his friend, a usability designer, and we spent a lot of time, and we built a site. And there it is. Now, this is still live. I just took a screenshot. It's got frames still, okay? But it, it, it works. And um, what was so cool is that this little tiny group, the website had great information because the usability designer was giving me great information and, the, and my, my friend was working with me and we were working all, you know, blood and sweat. I wanted to get it out but it took too long. We kept going um, and we scored an amazing executive director who helped it grow and grow and grow over the years. Okay, so one of the things I helped build was this ta fax tool. It, um, it would create custom letters and send it to the representatives, whether they were pro and con on something, on these issues we were pushing, and uh, a simple little template, which is still being used. It's in PHP, you type some text in, and um, it can make many different kinds of faxes, many different kinds of letter tools, which have now been faxed to representatives in California for tons of time, so much that they said, you know, please turn it off, we get the message. So it, it really helped make things happen, and Fast forward a couple years, <laughs> this happened, which is the California Disclose Act, which was signed by Governor Brown last year, which makes this sort of thing happen. Down now, you see right here, it used to be like paid for by Californians for California or something like that. Now it's paid for by, let's take a look. I, oh, let me see if I zoom up here, wrong one. I got it there. Oh, look, three dudes, rich dudes. Eli Brode, Reed Hastings, and, uh, oh, I lost it, all right, we'll go, back. Whoa, I really jumped. Hold on. All right, sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, and Michael Bloomberg, okay? So there's the three guys who paid for this ad. So that's the most strong disclosure law in California that we have. And so that's really fabulous. And who would have thought that 
my fax tool was still working on that. So, so when you make code and you put in your sweat and skills, it might be very useful and very powerful because this, this law that Governor Brown passed might have died about 15 times as it went through things, as it went through the different committees and everything, but it made it. And, and, and um, with the website, with the people that contributed, it really worked, so your code can live. Uh, what's coming up next? A social media disclose act, right? Because we need something like that in Facebook and everywhere else. Also a, peti a petition disclosure act. So these things can now happen. There's a lot of people in it. How many people are in the organization now? 100,000 people. So that little website has now grown to 100,000 people, which is great. Another thing, open source paper ballot voting. That's what's going on next. And of course, we know what DEF CON did with the, open, with the not open source voting. They sort of smashed the machines, but they also hacked them and broke them all. So that's kind of a big problem. Um, so look, right here's a picture of 125 non-programmers, non-state rep uh, rep state representatives, non-programmers who are supporting open source. So open source is not just for programming anymore. There it is. Um, and uh, so that's what's happening now, and the idea is that there's going to be um, an $8 million matching fund for building the system in San Francisco to try to get ready for the 2020 elections. So that's the second part of the message is this is happening, and uh, they're working on getting matching funds to build the system, and um, it's going to be GNU public license so that it's always free and any county can use it and any state can use it and any country can use it and make it, make it move forward. It'll be basically off the shelf components, touch screen voting, but a printed paper ballot which goes into a box which you can count with. So that's the key thing is to keep it separate. Um, uh, and people agree, uh, Open Source Initiative is a supporter, EFF is a supporter, uh, GitHub is a supporter and many, many more. Um, I've got the link there. Um, so jump in. Contribute, it might be in Python. So, you know, find the source and, and, and join in with it. Um, and uh, it was very worth it. It was hard, but it was worth it. And, and you can make a difference. Um, I was inspired by the talk um, last, last night, and um, there's going to be a meeting on tech and politics at 11 a.m. tomorrow, so I wanted to shout out for that. Um, SF Open Voting is where it's all happening. And uh, I'm I James at, on uh, Twitter. So, thank you very much. Thank you, James. I really must dust off my fax machine. Uh, the next up next is Andres, who's going to talk about processing. Please clap for him. So, hello. Hello, good night. Um, well, I'm Andres. Uh, I'm from Mexico, and this is my first PyCon. So. <laughs> well, why should we care about processing? Well, but what is processing? Uh, so. We know programming is, is fun, it's rewarding, it's challenging, it, it, pays, it, it pays the bills, but not everyone, not everyone knows that. And I was in that truck, so my first experience programming was uh, in re retrospective uh, like this, but uh, what I really saw was something like this. <laughs> hieroglyphs everywhere. So, uh, and th there was this dumb thing that uh, split the text to the screen. Uh, so, I, I wondered how, if it could render so pretty windows and so, and those pretty effects, how was I stuck with something like this? So, uh, Ben Fry and Casey Rias from the processing organization, they built this um, processing, uh, this Java library to, um, to avoid that kind of things. So what is processing? Uh, well, as I, as I already said, it was at first a Java library. Uh, and what can you do with it? Well, you can. Um, Sorry, uh, here it is. Um, well, you can do nice things, uh, graphical things. Uh, let, mm, well, it's not working. Or yes, yes, there it is. So I like, I love simulating. So uh, you can do visualization like that, or maybe. Uh, 
If you, if you love recursive trees, you can do recursive trees. You can do uh, like simulations if you're a scientist. You can do random visualization if you like. Uh, uh, another scientific visualization. Or, and from there you can go on and maybe make music with it. So, oh, there it is. Um, so, uh, and, oh, well, let me. Um, uh, where it is? Oh, here it is. So, and for the motors, uh, Well, for the motors here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, this, as I said, was started like a Java, Java library, but then moved on to, to other languages. So, um, what? And Python had, had its, uh, its part on it. So, is there a processing, uh, is there a Python, Python flavor? Yes, but it's, the official is in Python, so it's in top of Java, it's limited, it cannot use C libraries. It's Python 2, and not even Python 2, but as Raymond Hettinger may have said, there must be a better way. So, uh, and there is. Uh, in, in the last year, there was this thing, this project, P5, that is a processing port to Python, so you can install it. Uh, well, a little dis disclaimer, I'm not the developer, but I'm spreading the word. So, uh, processing is awesome. Uh, it's a learning visualization and creation tool. Um, and we can help to develop this so that more people can use it. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Andres. Up next is Meredith. Give me a big hand. Thank you. So, the web is, I will assert, not very Pythonic, and it's also notoriously really difficult to program for. Are these two problems related? Could we actually make the web a better platform by making it more Pythonic? Well, firstly, what do I mean by the web is not very Pythonic? Well, if you're making a typical web app, your data is going to have to be a bunch of different shapes on the way. It's going to start out usually as data within a, a tables in a database, which you access by SQL. You're then going to have to turn that into objects, usually Python objects, on your server, which then have methods and attributes of their own. Uh, you're then going to have to represent this in JSON with a whole bunch of REST endpoints to access and uh, manipulate them, uh, send that over HTTP, where your JavaScript is going to turn these HTTP requests into objects in JavaScript with their own methods, and then you have to turn those into HTML DOM objects, and then somehow render those into the pixels on the screen. At every level, every one of these transitions has a whole bunch of boring and repetitive and tedious translation work. And that is an invitation to exactly the wrong sort of magic. So let me take a completely unfair pot shot at SQL Alchemy, which is a library for translating uh, data in databases with SQL into Python objects. Uh, it's actually really good at it, which is why this is an unfair pot shot. You can even write query expressions like this, right? You know, book.price is less than 20. That's nice. But of course, the process from getting from that expression into SQL we can run on the database is black magic. It's it got meta classes. It's got overloading Python standard operators to do something completely different to what they normally do. And that's cool if you do it once. But if you have this amount of magic at every level in your stack, you are in for a bad day. And of course you do, right? You have ORMs to turn database tables into server objects. You have REST frameworks to try and help you express those server objects in JSON. You have JavaScript frameworks that turn these patterns of HTTP requests into JavaScript objects. You have templating engines that turn these JavaScript objects into the DOM 
and you have CSS frameworks to help you turn this DOM into the pixels you want on the screen. Well, how does that stack up against PEP20, the Zen of Python? There should be one and preferably only one way to do it. Oh boy. <laughs> Explicit is better than implicit. Well, all of these frameworks are implicit by their very nature. It's the only way they can save you that work. And if the implementation is hard to explain, it's a bad idea, look at all the magic at all these levels in the stack. Okay, so if the normal web stack is so unpythonic, what would a more pythonic version look like? Well, Python everywhere maybe. Uh, so in Anvil, we do this by having Python code and Python objects everywhere. Even on the client, we use the sculpt Python to JavaScript uh, compiler for the client side code. Check it out, it's great. So if we're looking at this stack, if we were working all in Python, if we were making a REST request, we'd make a function call to the requests library, and then after some long time, that would emerge as a function call to a Flask endpoint. Well, if all we wanted was a function call, why not make the function call the abstraction, right? So that's what we do. We take a function on the server, we tag it, hey, you can call this from the client, and then we can make this a function call where from the client uh, through to the server, we can have all the normal Python arguments, keyword arguments, and return values, and it's an awful lot nicer. Okay, so what kind of values should we be able to pass in as these arguments or return out? Well, I mean, strings, dicks, lists, anything that you can do in JSON, obviously. But we want objects from as far down this stack as we can get away with. Uh, but unfortunately, it's a web server, so this bottom of this stack needs to be stateless. Uh, because it's serving a lot of clients, it can't afford to hold all the objects in RAM. So we say we're going to support stateless objects. And stateless object, anything with an immutable ID, some list of methods, and maybe some permissions. And a good use case for this are database rows, right? The ID is the unique ID of that database row. We have methods like update, delete, and if we, it's Python, so if we implement get item and set item, we've now got square bracket dictionary style indexing on our database rows. Uh, obviously, we don't want anyone to do arbitrary uh, calls on database rows from the client, so we have signatures so they can only make calls on uh, objects that the server has already returned to them, uh, which is a fairly nice interface for security purposes. So what we end up with is a process where we can have an object in the database, a row in the database, and then return that straight from a function call in the server straight to the client, and the same object, we can index it in client code. And that it, so that's one object passed all the way from the database to the client. So we've skipped a whole bunch of these layers. And that's our little contribution to making the web more Pythonic. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Our last speaker of the day is Kenneth, who's going to tell us about the PSF, specifically running for the board thereof. See, I can read, you can too. We've duplicated the information several times there. I'll keep talking for another second and a half. Okay, Kenneth, please, give him a big hand. Hi, everybody. My name is Kenneth Wrights. Uh, if you'd like to, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Kenneth Wrights. And I am a board member of the Python Software Foundation. If you are uh, heavily involved with Python, as I assume everyone in this room is because you're here at PyCon, uh, I heavily recommend that you become a member of the Python Software Foundation. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, the mission of the Python Software Foundation is to promote, protect, and advance the Python programming language and to support and facilitate the growth of a diverse and international community of Python programmers. That's our official mission statement. So the primary functions of the Python Software Foundation are to protect the intellectual property of Python, that's CPython itself, as well as PyCon and other things that are related to it, and offer grants to Python user groups and educational programs around the world, and pay for and orchestrate PyCon US in North America. So it's responsible for this, org this event that we're partaking in right now, which is wonderful. So give them a clap. So we have two URLs for you. Uh, if you'd like to sign up to be a, a sponsor of the PSF, donations are always welcome. And there's def many different levels available. Uh, there's a URL here for you. And if you'd like to become a member, membership is free. Uh, you can just go, go to this URL as well to uh, sign up to be a member. Uh, but I'm a board member, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, we have 13 members of the board of the PSF. And it turns out that there is an election cycle uh, in that 
in which uh, people get elected to become board members. And right now, there are four seats available on the board. Uh, I am decided not to rerun this year, uh, for example. And uh, we have two people who have decided to be candidates so far. So there's room for more. Uh, this ridiculous link here you can go to <laughs> if you'd like to learn more about that. Or if you uh, want to cheat, you can Google 2018 PSF board election. And it's the second link down. <laughs> and that has the UR, that's the information that uh, will tell you all the current candidates, as well as the wiki page for if you want to submit someone that you know or yourself to be a board member. Uh, the deadline for submissions is May 25th, uh, 2018. And the election is going to be occurring on June 1st through June 10th. And uh, there's currently two candidates, as I said. Uh, I want to encourage everyone who's here that if they know anyone who's thinking about running or that they think would make an excellent candidate to represent the Python community, or that if they're from, especially if from a unique part of the world, um, to uh, advocate for them to run, encourage them to run. Um, and if they have any questions about that, we're going to be holding a Q&A session on Slack on May 22nd, 2018. So uh, if anyone has any questions about that, they can reach out to uh, the board or the, on, uh, e over email, and we'll be happy to facilitate any qu answers or questions that anybody has. And of course, follow the PSF on Twitter. It's at the PSF. And thank you very much. All right, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Kenneth. Thanks very much, the PSF. Thanks very much to each and every one of the Lightning Talk speakers. And thanks very much to each and every one of you for being here. Thanks to all the volunteers. Thanks to the conference staff. Thanks to the, you know, other thankable people. Uh, have a lovely evening. Good night. See you all tomorrow.